Chapter Six of the Convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. I will beg leave with the reader to precede the party which was just setting out from Brandon, and to give one more scene at the house of Mr. Clive, which took place shortly before their arrival. About a quarter of an hour after Edgar had turned his steps homeward, Mr. Clive entered the room where Helen was sitting and placed himself in a chair opposite to her but upon helen's part there was nothing like a bashful consciousness she had been accustomed to her lover's coming and going for years their mutual affection had sprung up so gradually or rather had developed itself so easily that she could hardly mark the time when they had not loved there had been none of those sudden changes which startled timid passion and neither her father nor sir arthur adelon had ever shown any of that apprehension in regard to their frequent meeting which might have created anxiety if not fear in her own breast she therefore looked up frankly in her father's face and said edgar has been here my dear father and unfortunately mr norris opened the door and came in while he was in the room but i am sure there is no cause for apprehension for i begged edgar not to speak of it to any one and he gave me his word that he would not mr clive cast down his eyes and thought for several minutes without reply but then he murmured some words more to himself than to his daughter saying that is bad that is unfortunate not that i doubt edgar my helen but i must speak with norris about it for he is somewhat rash and he may show himself to others not so much to be trusted that i do trust edgar you may well judge my dear child otherwise he would not be so often here he spoke gazing at his daughter with a look of some anxiety and with the white eyebrows drawn far over the eyes i know not that i am right my helen he added i almost begin to fear not i feel i should only be doing right if i were to bid this youth make his visits fewer and shorter and yet i would not pain him for a great deal for he is kind and good and honest but it must come to that in the end helen oh no my father no cried helen clive imploringly why should you do that listen to me helen said her father you have not thought of these things fully he loves you helen i know it cried helen clive with the ingenuous blood mounting into her cheek i know it and i love him but why should that prevent him from coming why should that deprive us of the very happiness which such love gives because it cannot be happy my helen answered her father because he is a gentleman of high degree and you the daughter of no better than a yeoman my father said helen rising and laying the hand that was uninjured on her father's arm have i not heard you say that the blood of the yeoman clive is as pure as that of the noble house of adelon and perhaps of older strain is not the land you cultivate your own as much or more than his that he farms to others there is not that difference between us that should be reasonably any bar but even suppose it were so what could you seek by separating us your own happiness my child answered clive gravely by making us both miserable some years months or weeks before we otherwise might be so rejoined helen eagerly that is all that can be done now we love as much as we can love and so long as we are doing naught that is wrong violating no duty to you nor to his father surely we may enjoy the little portion of happiness that is sure and leave to the future and god's good will the rest she spoke eagerly and with her colour heightened her eye full of light and her beautiful lips quivering in their vehemence and clive could not help feeling a portion of a father's pride rise up and take part with her he could not but say to himself as he gazed at her in her beauty she is worthy to be the bride of the greatest lord in all the land well helen well he said using an expression which was habitual to him I must trust you both but remember my child in making over to you the care of your own happiness i put mine under your guardianship also for mine is wrapped up in yours but hark there is norris pacing to and fro above i must go and speak with him 
that wild spirit will not brook its den much longer and walking to the door he mounted the stairs to the room which was just over that where he had been sitting ah you are come back at last clive said the strong hard-featured man whom i have before described well what have you heard were all those movements that alarmed you so much last night but mere idle rumour no answered clive but i find you were not the object a party of smugglers was taken farther down the coast and the intimation which the officer so mysteriously hinted to me they had received referred to that affair to be sure replied his companion they all think me in the united states no one but yourself has ever known that i was in france the while i can't help thinking my good friend replied clive that it might have been better for you to have stayed there you know you are in jeopardy here and may be recognised at any moment well well clive answered his companion i will not jeopardise you long it is my intention to go on this very night so do not be alarmed i thank you much for what you have done which is as much or more than i could expect and i am only sorry that poor helen has been injured in my cause clive looked at him steadfastly for a moment or two with his usual calm steady grave expression of countenance and then replied with a faint smile it is curious norris how whenever men are blamed by their best friends for a foolish action when it is committed or warned against a rash action which they are determined to commit they always affect to believe that there is some personal feeling actuating their counsellor and persuade themselves that his advice is not good not by trying it on the principles of reason but by their own prejudices i have no personal fears in the matter i anticipate no danger to myself or to my family neither should you think so last night i was ready to have shed my blood to ensure your safety which i certainly should not have been likely to do if i were a man full of the cold calculations you suppose well 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 clive said norris interrupting him i was wrong i was wrong think of it no more but one meets so much cold calculation in this life that one's heart gets chilled to one's best friends my coming might indeed as you say be what the world would call rash but every attempt must be estimated by its object and till you know mine do not judge me hastily where i was wrong was in not giving you sufficient intimation of my intention that you might have prepared and let me know when i could land without risk that the man i sent over to you was delayed one whole day for a passage and that day made a great difference it did answered clive for i had barely time to send my own two men away to a distance and get others in whom i could better trust to help me i had no means either of giving you warning that there was a great movement at barhampton and that the officers were evidently on the lookout for some one on the coast you only said that you would land in the cove between nine and ten and that i must show a light due east of the cove mouth to guide you as there was no moon i had nothing for it therefore but to make ready against attack in order that you might get back to the boat if you were the person these men were looking for but now norris i am very anxious to hear what is your object for it should be a great one to induce you to undertake such a risk it is a great one answered norris with his grey eyes flashing under his contracted brow no less than the salvation of my country clive in that last affair the rash fools of the manufacturing districts hurried on against all persuasion before matters were half ripe with the light spirit of the old gauls firm in the onset daunted by the first cheek and tame and crouching in defeat had they behaved like men i would have remained with them to the last to perish or to suffer but there was no shame in abandoning men who abandoned their own cause at the very first frown of fortune now there is a brighter prospect before me and before england there are sterner calmer more determined spirits ready and willing to dig a mine beneath the gaudy fabric of corruption and tyranny which has been built up by knavish statesmen in this land and to spring the mine when it is dug the boasted constitution of england which protects and nurses a race of privileged tyrants and refuses justice ay and almost food to the great mass of the people is like one of the feudal castles of the old barons of the land built high and strong 
to protect them in their aggressions upon their neighbours, and in their despotic rule over their serfs. But there have been times in this and other lands when the serfs, driven to madness by unendurable tyranny, have, with the mattock and the axe of their daily toil, dug beneath the walls of the stronghold and cast it in ruins to the ground. So will we, Clive, so will we. Clive crossed his arms upon his chest and gazed at him with a thoughtful and a melancholy look. And when he had done, he shook his head sadly, as if his mind could take no part in the enthusiastic expectations of his companion. Why do you shake your head, Clive? demanded Norris impatiently. "'Because I have lived long enough, my good friend,' replied Clive, "'to see some hundreds of these schemes devised, perfected, executed, "'and every one has brought ruin upon the authors, "'and worked no amelioration in the institutions of the land. "'Simply because men are tame under injuries, "'simply because they submit to injustice, "'simply because, out of every ten men in the land, "'there is not one who has a just notion of the dignity of man's nature,' or a just appreciation of man's rights was the eager reply of norris but their eyes have been opened clive the burden is becoming intolerable the very efforts that have been made and the struggles that have been frustrated have taught our fellow-countrymen that there is something to struggle for some great object for endeavour they have asked themselves what and we have taught them our success only one great success and the enormous multitude of those who are justly discontented with the foul and corrupt system which has been established but who have yet daunted by repeated failures will rise as one man and claim that which is due to the whole human race sweeping away all obstacles with the might and the majesty of a torrent you clive you i am sure are not insensible to the wrongs which we all suffer I am neither unaware that there are many evils tolerated by law, nor many iniquities sanctioned by law, replied Clive, nor insensible to the necessity of their removal. But, at the same time, I am fully convinced that there is a way by which they can be removed, and that the only way in which they ever will be removed, without violence or bloodshed, or the many horrors and disasters which must always accompany anything like popular insurrection, when the people of england think fit to make their voice heard i mean the great mass of the people that voice is strong enough to sweep away slowly but surely every one of the wrongs of which we have cause to complain but how can it make itself heard that voice of the people of england demanded norris where can it make itself heard the people of england the many the multitude the strength of the land the labouring poor have no voice in the senate at the bar on the bench the church of the majority is the rich man's church the law of the land is the rich man's law the parliament of the country is the rich man's parliament but it is vain talking with you of such things now but come and hear us for one single night hear our arguments hear our resolutions and you will not hesitate to join us no replied clive in a firm tone i will not norris i would rather trust myself to calm deliberate thought than to exciting oratory or smooth persuasions in fact norris as you well know and as i have known long i am of too eager and impetuous a nature too easily moved to place myself willingly in temptation when i argue tranquilly with myself i am master of myself but when i go and listen to others the strong passions of my young nature rise up I keep myself free from all brawls. I enter into disputes with no man, for in my past life the blow of anger has too frequently preceded the word of remonstrance, and I have more than once felt occasion to be ashamed of myself as an impetuous fool, even where I have not had to reproach myself as an unjust aggressor. "'You have had enough to bear, Clive,' replied Norris, "'as I know from my poor lost Mary, your dear sister.' The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes. With the old Saxon blood strong in your veins, the old Saxon freedom powerful in your heart, 
have not you and yours from generation to generation been subject to the predominating influence of the norman usurpers and are you not still under their sway but hark there are people at the door and many of them perhaps they have come to seek me clive strode hastily to the window and looked out but then turned round saying no it is the people from brandon house sir arthur adelon and all the rest come down i dare say to inquire after helen for they are very fond of her as well they may be sir arthur adelon repeated norris with a slight smile that is well let me look at him and he too approached the window he is much changed he continued as he gazed out and perhaps as much changed in mind as in person but yet i must have him with us clive he must give us his support for it is necessary to have some gilding and some tinsel even on the flag of liberty clive laughed aloud you mistake norris he said if you calculate thus rashly your schemes are vain indeed sir arthur adelon is a mere man of the world kind and good-humoured enough but with no energy or resolution such as are absolutely necessary in those who join in great undertakings it is you who mistake clive replied norris you see but the exterior underneath there are strong things mingled with weak ones passions powerful enough and persevering and you shall see that man with his high station wealth and name shall go with me in that which i undertake and shall prove a shelter and defence in case of need should anything discover a portion of our schemes before they are matured i must see him this very day before i go to barhampton for thither i shall certainly proceed to-night well norris well you know best answered clive with a faint smile when i see these wonders i may have more confidence till then i tell you fairly all your plans seem to me to be rashness approaching to madness i must go down and receive them however for i hear they have come in shall i tell sir arthur that you wish to see him norris no answered the other thoughtfully i will make my own opportunity and clive departed leaving him alone End of chapter six chapter seven of the convict by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven i know no more delightful sensation upon earth than when a being whom we love acting beneath our eyes but unconscious that we are watching fulfils to the utmost the bright expectations that we have formed while in the deed and the tone and the manner we see the confirmation of all that we had supposed or dreamed or divined of excellence in heart and mind charles dudley loved eda brandon and all she did or said was of course a matter of deep interest to him and although i will not say he watched yet he observed her conduct during the morning of which i have been writing and especially during their visit to the grange as mr clive's house was called he thought it was perfect and so perhaps it was as nearly as anything of the earth can be perfect and perhaps although there was no great event to call strong feelings into action although there was nothing which would seem to an ordinary eye a trial of character or demeanour yet there was much which to a very keen and sensitive mind showed great qualities by small traits helen clive was in an inferior position of life to eda brandon it may be said that the difference was very slight that her father cultivated his own land that she had evidently received the education and possessed the manners of a lady but yet the very slightness of the difference might make the demeanour of the one towards the other more difficult not perhaps to be what the world would call very proper but to be perfect it might be too cold it might be too familiar for there is sometimes such a thing as familiarity which has its rise in pride and the object of it is more likely to feel hurt by it than even by distance of manner but there was nothing of the kind in the conduct of eda brandon she treated helen in every respect as an equal one with whom she had been long on terms of intimate affection and who required no new proof that she saw no difference between the position of mr clive's daughter 
and that of the heiress of brandon and all its wealth there was no haughtiness there was no appearance of condescension the haughtiest mark of pride it was easy kind unaffected but quiet and ladylike and although helen herself felt a little nervous not at the station but at the number of the guests who poured in eda's manner soon put her completely at ease and the only thing which seemed at all to discompose her was a certain sort of familiar gallantry in the manners of lord hadley which even pained another present more than herself but it is with eda and dudley that i wish particularly to deal just now and one thing i may remark as seemingly strange but not really so it was with delight as i have said that dudley observed the demeanour of eda brandon towards helen clive but a saddening sensation of despondency mingled with the pleasure and rendered it something more than melancholy it was like that of a dying parent witnessing the success and growing greatness of a beloved child and knowing that his own eyes must soon close upon the loved one's career of glory he said to himself she never can be mine long years of labour and toil struggles with a hard and difficult profession and fortunate chances with many long lapses between could alone put me in a position to seek her love or ask her hand and in the meantime her fate must be decided as they had walked down from the house lord hadley had been continually by her side he had evidently been much struck and captivated a vague hint had been thrown out that a union between himself and the heiress of brandon had been contemplated by kind and judicious friends and a meaning smile which had crossed the lip of young edgar adelon when he saw lord hadley bending down and saying something apparently very tender in his cousin's ear had sent a pang through the heart of dudley which his young companion would not have inflicted for the worlds had he known the circumstances again and again dudley repeated to himself it is impossible how can i why should i entertain any expectation the warrior goes into the strife armed the racer is trained and prepared for the course i have no weapons for the struggle no preparation for the race although the prize is all that is desirable in life i will yield this all vain contention i will withdraw from a scene where everything which takes place must give me pain it is easily done the term of my engagement with lord hadley is nearly at an end and i can easily plead business of importance for leaving him here now that our tour is finished and once more betaking myself to my books wait in patience till the time comes for that active life in the hard world of realities which will i trust engross every feeling and occupy every thought such were his reflections and resolutions as the party after taking leave of helen and mr clive walked out of the door of the grange to return to brandon house i often think that all reflections are vain and all resolutions worse than vain the first are but as the games of childhood the construction of gay fabrics out of materials which have no solidity the second are but shuttlecocks between the battledoors of circumstances so at least charles dudley found them both it is necessary however before i proceed farther to say something of the exact position of the parties as they quitted the house eda and her uncle went first dudley followed half a step farther back and lord hadley and edgar came next as dudley was walking on with his eyes bent on the ground he heard the voice of sir arthur's son exclaim eda eda we are going down by the stream lord hadley and i to see the ruins of the priory let us all go no dear edgar answered miss brandon i can't indulge your wandering propensities to-day i shall be tired by the time i get home and have got a letter to write i can't go either edgar said his father for i have a good deal of business to do well mr dudley at all events you will come said edgar adelon but mr dudley replied by informing him that he had passed some time at the priory already that morning well come along lord hadley then said edgar in a gay tone i never saw such uninteresting people in my life and you shall have the treat and the benefit of my conversation all to yourself 
I will tell you the legend, too, and show you what a set of people these Brandons have been from generation to generation. Lord Hadley did not decline, and they walked away together down the course of the stream, whilst Sir Arthur and his niece, accompanied by Dudley, pursued their course towards Brandon. They were about halfway between the Grange and the gates of the park, when a quick but heavy step was heard behind them, and Dudley, turning his head, saw a stout farm-servant following, somewhat out of breath. The man walked straight up to Sir Arthur Adelon and presented a note, saying, "'I was to give you that directly, Your Honour.' Sir Arthur took the note and looked at the address without any apparent emotion, but when he opened it his aspect changed considerably, and he stopped, saying, in a hesitating manner, "'I must go back. I must go back. "'Oh, it is but a short distance,' said Eda. "'We can return with you.' "'No, my dear, no,' answered her uncle, with what seemed a good deal of embarrassment in his air. "'You had better go on to Brandon. Mr. Dudley will, I am sure, escort you.' "'Assuredly,' replied Dudley, gravely, and Sir Arthur adding, "'I may not, perhaps, be back to luncheon, Eda, but do not wait for me.' Turned and with a quick step hurried along the road towards Mr. Clive's house. It seemed as if everything had combined to leave Charles Dudley and Eda Brandon alone together. If he had laboured a couple of years for such a consummation, it would not have occurred. He did not offer Eda his arm, however, and although his heart was beating very fast with feelings that longed for utterance, he walked on for at least a hundred and fifty yards without a word being spoken on either side. Ladies, however, feel the awkwardness of silence more than men, and Eda, though she was shaking very unaccountably, said at length, "'I am afraid, Mr. Dudley, that what you find here is not so beautiful and interesting as the scenes you have lately come from. You used, I remember, to be a very enthusiastic admirer of the beauties of nature.' Dudley raised his fine eyes to her face, and gazed at her for a moment with melancholy gravity. "'All I admired then,' he said at length, "'I admire now. "'All I loved then, dear Miss Brandon, I love now. "'It is circumstances which have changed, not I.' "'I did not know that circumstances had changed,' said Eda in a low and sweet tone, "'as if she really felt sympathy with him for the grief his manner implied. "'I had heard that a sad, a terrible change of circumstances had occurred some time before.' "'but I was not at all aware that any new cause of grief or disappointment had been added.' "'Dudley again thought before he answered, "'but it was not the thought of calculation, or, if it was, "'it was but the calculation of how he should answer calmly, "'how he should speak the true feelings of his heart with moderation and gentleness, "'not at all a calculation of whether it were better to speak those feelings or not. "'You are right, Miss Brandon,' he said. The change of circumstances had taken place before, but all things have their consequences, and the results of those material alterations in fortune and station which had befallen me were still to be made manifest to and worked out by myself. When we first met, you were very young, not sixteen, I think, and I was not old. Everything was in the spring day with me. It was all full of promise. I had in those days two fortunes, worldly wealth, and even a greater store of happy hopes and expectations, the bright and luxurious patrimony of inexperienced youth. From time to time we saw each other, till, when last we met, prosperity had been taken from me, the treasure of earthly riches was gone, and though not actually beggared, I and my poor father were in a state of absolute poverty. Still the other fortune, that richest state of youthful hope and inexperienced expectation, though somewhat diminished, was not altogether gone. I fancied that, in the eyes of the noble and the good, wealth would make no difference. I had never found it make any difference to me in my estimation of others. I imagined that those qualities which some had esteemed and liked in me would still at least retain my friends. I never for an instant dreamed that it could or ought to have an influence on the adamant of love. I had almost said and done rash things in those days, but you went away out of London, and I soon began to perceive that I had bitterly deceived myself. 
"'You never perceived any difference in me,' cried Eda, her voice trembling with emotions which carried away all discretion. "'You do not mean to say, Mr. Dudley, that you saw, or that you thought you saw, such base weakness in my nature, as would render of the slightest value in my eyes a change of fortune in those I—I—' I... And extending her left hand, as if to cast the idea from her, she turned away, and shook her head sorrowfully, with her eyes full of tears. "'No, no, Miss Brandon,' answered Dudley. "'No, no, Eda, I said not so. It was the world taught me the world's views. Nay, more, I laid the blame of misunderstanding those views upon myself, not others. I saw some reason even in those views which debarred me from happiness. I felt the due value of station and fortune when I had lost them, which I never felt while they were my own. But listen to me still with patience for one moment. Expectation was not yet fully tamed. I said to myself, I will make myself a station, I will regain the fortune which has been lost, and then, perhaps, love may re-illumine the torch of hope at its own flame, and all will be light once more. "'Love!' murmured Eda in a low tone, as he paused for an instant. But Dudley went on. The hardest lesson of all was still to learn. How slow, how hopelessly slow, is man's progress up the steep hill, which leads to fame and emolument in this world. How vain is the effort to start into eminence at once. I had to learn all that consuming thought, and bitter care, and deep disappointment, and hopeless love, and the anguish of regret, can do to wear the strongest frame and wring the firmest heart, and quell the brightest expectations, and batten down the springs of life and hope beneath the heavy load of circumstances. "'Oh, Dudley, Dudley!' cried Eda. "'Why, why should you yield to such dark impressions?' "'Eda,' said Dudley, "'would you have had me hope?' "'Yes, yes,' she answered with her cheek glowing, and her eyes full of tears as they passed the park gates and entered the avenue hope ever ever hope and let not adverse circumstances crush a noble spirit and a generous heart see there is mr filmer coming down towards us i must wipe these foolish tears from my eyes but let me add one warning i have said a generous heart because indeed i believe yours to be so but yet dudley it was hardly generous enough when you imagined that those whom you judged worthy of love and esteem could suffer one consideration of altered fortunes to make even the slightest change in their regard or in their conduct. You should never have fancied it, and must never, never fancy it again. I can hardly imagine, she said, turning and looking at him with a bright smile, as she uttered words of reproach which she knew were not quite justified thus qualifying with that gay look the bitter portion of her speech i can hardly imagine that you know what true love is or you will be well aware that it is indeed as you said yourself a thing of adamant unchangeable and everlasting on it no calumny can rest no falsehood make impression the storms and tempests of the world the labour of those who would injure or defame the sharp chisel of sarcasm the grinding power of argument and opposition can have no effect. Such is strong, true love. It must be love founded on esteem and confidence. But then, believe me, it is immovable. If ever you love, remember this. If ever I love, Eda, answered Dudley, gazing at her, you know too well that I do love, that I have loved for years. "'I once thought so,' replied Eda in a low tone. "'But hush, Dudley, hush! Let us compose ourselves. He is coming near.' "'He does not see us,' said Dudley. "'His eyes are bent upon the ground. Can we not avoid him by turning through the trees?' "'No, no,' answered Miss Brandon. "'He sees everything. Never suppose at any time that because his eyes are bent down they are unused. He is all sight, and never to be trusted. Is my cheek flushed?' i am sure it ought to be she added as her mind reverted to the words she had spoken i am sure it ought to be for i feel it burn a little replied dudley gazing at her with a look of grateful love but he will not remark it 
oh yes he will answered edith giving a timid glance towards dudley's face and then drawing down her veil yours is quite pale it is with intense emotions replied dudley emotions of gratitude and love hush hush she said no more on that score we shall be able to talk more hereafter what a beautiful day it has been after such a stormy night one could almost fancy that it was spring returned if a bird would but begin to sing ah no answered dudley somewhat sorrowfully though there be browns in both the colours of the autumn are very different from those of the spring the hues of nascent hope are in the one of withering decay in the other and though the skies of autumn may be glorious they are the skies of spring which are sweet they were now within some twenty or thirty paces of mr filmer who was still walking on calmly and quietly with his eyes bent upon the ground as if absorbed in deep and solemn meditation the light and shadow as he passed the trees fell strangely upon him giving a phantom-like appearance to his tall dark figure and pale face and there was a fixed and rigid firmness in his whole countenance which might have made any casual observer at that moment think him the veriest ascetic that ever lived eda who knew him well and had read his character more profoundly than he imagined led the way straight up to him though they had before been on the other side of the avenue as if she were determined that he should not pass without taking notice of them and when they were at not more than three yards distance he started saying ah oh, my dear young lady i did not see you why your party has become small and his face at once assumed a look of pleasing urbanity which rendered the whole expression as different as possible from that which his countenance had borne before. "'Edgar and Lord Hadley,' answered Eda, "'have gone to see the Priory, and my uncle was coming home with us when somebody stopped him upon business and carried him off.' "'Mr. Dudley and I visited the Priory this morning,' replied Mr. Filmer, "'and he seemed exceedingly pleased with it, I am happy to say.' "'I was very much so, indeed,' said Dudley in truth my reverend friend i feel a great interest in all those remnants of former times when everything had a freshness and a vigorous identity which is lost in the present state of civilization i forget who is the author who compares man in the present polished and artificial days to a worn shilling which has lost all trace of the original stamp but it has often struck me as a very just simile i like the mark of the die and every object which recalls to my mind the lusty active past is worth a thousand modern constructions even the university in which i have been educated i love not so much for its associations with myself as for its associations with another epoch there is a cloistral secluded calm about some of the colleges which has an effect almost melancholy and yet pleasurable Mr. Filmer replied in an easy strain, as if he had remarked nothing. But, nevertheless, he had perceived, somehow, without even raising his eyes, that Eda had dropped the veil over her face as he came near. And he saw that there were traces of agitation both on her countenance and on that of Dudley. He remarked, too, that Dudley spoke more and more eloquently upon many subjects during the rest of the day, that, in fact, there was a sort of relief apparent in his whole manner and in all his words and he formed a judgment not very far from the truth such a judgment from indications so slight is not unusual in men who have been educated as he had been to mark the slightest peculiarities of manner the slightest changes of demeanour that occur in their fellow men in order to take advantage of them for their own purposes in the present instance he continued quietly his observations without letting any one perceive that he was watching at all but not a word not a look nor a tone of eda brandon and charles dudley escaped him during the day turning back with miss brandon and her lover towards the house mr filmer or father peter as he was sometimes called by sir arthur's servants accompanied them to the door and then proposed that they should cross the park to a little fountain covered with its old cross and stone which he described as well worthy of dudley's attention eda confirmed his account of its beauty but said that she must herself go in as she was a good deal fatigued and had also to write a letter 
she advised dudley however to go and see it and if the truth must be told she was not sorry to avoid the priest's society for in his presence she felt a restraint of which she could not divest herself even at times when she could detect no watching on the part of filmer she knew that he was observing with the quiet shrewd eyes of rome and the very feeling embarrassed her dudley had no excuse for staying behind and he accompanied the priest on his walk conversing on indifferent subjects and not yet fully aware that every word and every look was watched by one who let naught fall to the ground for nearly a couple of hundred yards the two gentlemen walked on in silence but then mr filmer in pursuit of his own investigations observed in a sort of meditative tone what a sweet charming girl that is i think i understood that you had known her long mr dudley for many years replied his companion when first i knew her she was quite a girl i had almost said a child and very lovely even then but i had no idea that she was the niece of sir arthur adelon her mother was his sister replied mr filmer and the way in which she became sir arthur's ward was this her father died when she was quite young leaving her entirely to the control of her mother as her sole guardian and his executrix she was a very amiable woman mrs brandon though unfortunately her husband had converted her to your church i believe she was very sorry for her apostasy before her death and at all events she left miss brandon to the guardianship of her brother sir arthur with the entire management of her property till she comes of age i suppose dudley replied as the other made a short pause yes but before that time she will be probably married answered the priest to lord hadley perhaps you think rejoined dudley with very different feelings from those with which he would pronounce such words some two or three hours before oh no answered mr filmer calmly i do not think that sir arthur would ever consent to her marriage with a protestant i know that he would sooner see her bestow her hand upon the humblest catholic gentleman in england dudley was somewhat puzzled if the assertion of the priest could be relied upon why had sir arthur adelon so ostentatiously asked lord hadley there the priest said it in a natural easy tone but dudley felt that in some degree he had himself been trying to extract information from mr filmer and that the attempt was somewhat dangerous with the roman catholic priest he did not feel quite sure indeed that he had not betrayed a part of his own secrets while endeavouring to gain intelligence of the views of others i should have thought that the feelings of sir arthur adelon were more liberal especially as he has always yourself beside him said dudley with a slight inclination of the head you do me more than justice my young friend replied mr filmer it is very natural in these times when there is a persecuting and oppressive spirit abroad that we should wish to see an heiress of great wealth and whose husband must possess great influence bestow her hand upon a person of our own religious creed i may say this can be felt without the slightest degree of bigotry or any view of proselytism i have none i can assure you and indeed you may judge that it is so when you know that one of my best friends and most constant companions is the clergyman of the little church the spire of which you see rising up there just above the hill my feeling is that there is not sufficient difference between the two churches although yours i feel is in some points a little heretical to cause any disunion between honest and well-meaning men and moreover though anxious myself to see others adopt what i conceive to be just views yet i confess the object of their conversion does not appear to me so great a one as to hazard the slightest chance of dissension in order to obtain it those are very liberal opinions indeed said dudley and though i know that a good many of the laymen of the church of rome entertain them i was not aware that they are common amongst the clergy more common than you imagine my young friend answered the priest in fact the heads of the church itself are not so intolerant as you suppose rules have been fixed undoubtedly definitions have been given but it is always in the power of the church to relax its own regulations and when sincere and devout christianity a feeling of that which is orthodox and a veneration of those traditions which descending from generation to generation through the mouths of saints and martyrs may be considered as pure and 
uncorrupt as the scriptures themselves are perceived in any one the church is always willing to render his return to her bosom easy and practicable by relinquishing all those formal points of discipline which may be obnoxious to his prejudices and by relaxing the severity of those expositions the cutting clearness of which is repugnant to a yet unconfirmed mind dudley paused in great surprise asking himself what is his object this is a question which is rarely put by any man to his own heart without some strong doubt of the sincerity of the person he has been conversing with what is his object thought dudley does he really hope to convert me by the mingled charms of his own eloquence and the fascination of my dear eda's fortune he resolved however not to display his real opinion of the arguments used but to suffer the worthy priest to pursue his own course and expose his own purposes he must do it sooner or later he said and then i shall discover what is the meaning of this long discourse in the meantime he cannot shake eda's confidence in me nor my love for her i am happy to find continued dudley aloud that such very just and liberal views are entertained for undoubtedly the definitions of the council of trent have been one of the great stumbling-blocks in the way of those persons who would willingly have abandoned doctrines of which they are by no means sure to embrace others emanating from a church the principal boast of which is its invariable consistency with itself the priest looked at him with a doubtful and hesitating glance he was apprehensive perhaps of showing too much of the policy of the church of rome and he stopped as it was his invariable custom to do when the expression of his opinions might do injury to the cause he advocated and no great object was to be obtained he thought indeed in the present instance that something more might be ventured but yet he judged it more prudent to wait a while calculating that if he managed well growing passion might do the work of argument and after viewing with dudley the little fountain he turned back to the house directing his conversation to subjects of a totally different character grave but not ascetic round which he threw a peculiar and extraordinary charm it was very strange the fascination of his manner and conversation when first its power was felt by any keen and quick mind one strove to grasp and analyse it to ascertain in what it consisted but like those subtle and delicate essences which chemists sometimes prepare and which defy analysis something and that the most important that which gave efficacy and vigour to the whole always escaped the words seemed nothing in themselves a little subtle perhaps somewhat vague not quite definite the manner was calm and gentle the look was only at wide distant moments emphatic but yet there was a certain spirit in the whole which seemed to glide into the heart and brain unnerving and full of languor disarming opposition persuading rather than convincing wrapping their senses in pleasing dreams rather than presenting tangible objects for their exercise it was like the faint odours of unseen plants which stealing through the night air visit us with a narcotic rather than a balmy influence and lull us to a deadly sleep without our knowing whence they come or feeling the effect till it is too late End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of the Convict by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight. Sir Arthur Adelon, after leaving Eda and Dudley together, hurried back as fast as he could go to the house of Mr. Clive, passing by the way the man who had brought him the note, which he still held clasped firmly in his hand. He was evidently a good deal agitated when he set out the muscles of his face worked his brow contracted and muttered sentences escaped his lips from this state he seemed to fall into deep thought the emotions probably were not less intense but they were more profound and when he came near the house he stopped and leaned for a moment against the gate murmuring what can it be after a pause of a moment or two he rang the bell and asked the maid who appeared where the gentleman was who had sent him that letter 
the woman seemed somewhat confused said she did not know anybody had sent him a letter but that mr clive was in the drawing-room with his daughter her embarrassment and that of the baronet however were removed almost as she spoke the last words by a voice calling down the stairs and saying sir arthur adelon will you do me the honour of walking up hither the baronet instantly obeyed the invitation but it was with a very pale face and the next instant he was in the room with norris the latter had withdrawn into the chamber where his conference had taken place with clive and he fixed a steadfast gaze on the baronet as he entered then turning towards the door he closed it and waved his visitor to a seat taking one himself at the same time and still keeping his bright grey eyes fixed firmly upon the baronet's face hitherto not a word had been spoken and norris remained silent for some instants but at length he said i perceive both by your coming and your demeanour sir arthur adelon that you have not forgotten me oh no mr norris replied the baronet i remember you quite well and am happy to see you but is it not somewhat dangerous for you to visit england just now not in the least i think said norris i am obliged to you for your solicitude sir arthur if it had shown itself materially twelve months ago it might have kept me out of york castle i really do not see how i could have served you answered sir arthur adelon indeed i never knew that you were in york castle for three days replied norris laconically but this is irrelevant let me speak of more important affairs as your memory is so good you have probably not forgotten yet what took place eight and six years ago in regard to transactions affecting charles dudley esq since dead well sir well cried sir arthur what of that you inquired once said norris for the correspondence respecting that affair i think i could give you some information concerning it was it not burnt exclaimed sir arthur you told me it was burnt pardon me sir arthur replied norris i never told you any such thing my partner did but he lied in this case as in many others and i who knew little of the transaction at the time found the papers after his death and have them safe in my possession there was some writing paper lying on the table clean and unsullied but without knowing what he did sir arthur adelon took it in his hands and in two minutes it was twisted into every conceivable shape norris gazed at him with the slightest possible smile and in the end he said i am afraid sir arthur that paper will not be very serviceable however we can get more Pah! cried sir arthur adelon let us think of serious things mr norris those letters must be destroyed do you mean to say they were all preserved every one answered norris nay more i have spoken of eight and of six years ago but amongst the documents there are several of a much earlier period which show that the schemes then executed had been long devising that the purpose then accomplished had been long nourished the motives too are very evident from certain passages and i now tell you sir arthur adelon that if i had been made aware of the facts of the whole facts those schemes would never have been accomplished that purpose would have been frustrated and he gazed sternly at the baronet setting his teeth hard my partner mr sherborne continued norris after a long pause during which his companion uttered not a word but remained with his eyes bent down and his teeth gnawing his nether lip my partner mr sherborne was a great scoundrel as you know sir arthur in fact you knew it at the time you employed him no sir i did not exclaimed sir arthur catching at the last word yes sir arthur you did replied norris firmly or you never would have employed him in so rascally a business he suggested to me everything that was done replied the baronet eagerly in consequence of a private conversation of which he made a note replied norris and of a letter still preserved so confirmatory of the memorandum that there can be no doubt of its accuracy the face of sir arthur adelon flushed he was a man of one sort of courage and he replied haughtily 
"'I think you intend to insult me, sir. "'Beware of what you are doing.' "'I am quite aware,' answered Norris, slowly inclining his head. "'Neither do I intend at all to insult you, Sir Arthur. "'I speak truth in plain terms, "'having learned in sorrow and adversity "'that such is the only right course to pursue. "'In justice and in good faith, "'I ought to place the whole of those papers "'in the hands of a gentleman nearly related to that Mr. Dudley. "'His son, I mean.' "'It could do him no good,' exclaimed the baronet. "'The thing is past and gone.' He ruined the dead. Nothing can by any farther means be recovered. This Mr. Dudley could not regain a shilling, nor an acre of his father's property, as you well know. True, replied Norris. There are some things in law which have no remedy, as I do well know. But it is right that the son should learn who ruined his father, and he should have known long ago, but for one circumstance which may perhaps operate still farther. "'What is that?' demanded the baronet quickly. "'I have no objection whatsoever to give a considerable sum for the possession of those papers. "'They can be of no use to any one but myself. "'Come, let us talk reasonably, Mr. Norris. "'Let us say a thousand pounds.' "'Money will not do here, sir,' answered the other, in a contemptuous tone. "'It had its effect upon Mr. Sherborne, who was a rascal, "'but it will have no effect upon his partner, who is an honest man.' "'Then what, in heaven's name, do you want?' demanded Sir Arthur Adelon. "'To see you act up to your professions, Sir Arthur,' replied Norris. "'At the election which began poor Mr. Dudley's ruin, and which I had some share in conducting on your part, you professed, and I readily believe entertained, for I think that, in that at least, you were sincere, principles of firm and devoted attachment to the cause of the people.' "'You declared that if they did but return you to Parliament, "'you would advocate all measures in favour of their rights and liberties. "'You were more than what is called a radical. "'You were a reformer, in the true sense of the word. "'You gloried in being descended from the old Saxon race. "'You pointed out that your name itself "'was but a corruption of that one of our last Saxon princes, "'and you promised to do your best to restore to the people "'that perfect freedom which is an inalienable inheritance of the Saxon blood. You called your son Edgar, in memory of Edgar Atheling, and you promised, in my hearing, to maintain those principles at all times and under all circumstances, with your voice, with your hand, with your heart's blood. Now, Sir Arthur, I call upon you to redeem that promise, and if you do, in the way I shall point out, you shall have those papers." I have kept them back from the person to whom, perhaps, they ought justly to have been given, because I would not blacken the name of one whom I believed to be a true patriot. I found excuses for you in your own mind, to excuse myself, my retention of them. I knew you to be a man of strong passions under a calm exterior. I knew that strong passions, whenever they become masters, are sure to become despots and I thought that you had acted to the man we have mentioned, under an influence that was overpowering, the influence of the strongest and most ungovernable of all the passions, the thirst for revenge. Revenge? exclaimed Sir Arthur. Who told you I was moved by revenge? No one told me, answered Norris. I knew it. I might have read it in every line of those letters. I might have seen it in every deed you did. "'But there was a portion of your previous history, Sir Arthur, "'which I knew from my connection with that part of the country, "'and which, when once the machinations were exposed to my view, "'afforded the key to all. "'I assure you, Sir Arthur Adelon, "'whether some six or seven-and-twenty years ago "'Mr. Charles Dudley did not carry off from your pursuit "'the lady on whom you had fixed your heart?' Sir Arthur Adelon's usually placid face assumed the expression of a demon, and no longer averting his eyes from the fixed, stern gaze of Norris, he stared full in his face in return, and slowly inclined his head. He said not a word, but that look and that gesture were sufficient reply. They said, more plainly than any words could have spoken, "'You have divined it all. You have fathomed the dark secret of my heart to the bottom.' 
"'Well, Sir Arthur,' continued Norris, with a softened air, "'I can excuse strong passions, for I have them myself, "'and I know them at times to be irresistible. "'In your case, I was sure you had been thus moved. "'I looked upon you as a man devoted to the service of your country, "'and I thought that, in a case where all other considerations "'should give place to the interests of my country, "'it would be wrong to damn for ever the name of one "'who might do her the best and highest of services.' there was but one thing that made me doubt your sincerity you should not doubt it said sir arthur i am as sincerely devoted to the service of my country as ever it is your general sincerity to which i allude said the plain-spoken norris and the reason why i doubted it is this when you had effected your purpose when you had ruined an honest and good man though a norman and an aristocrat you did not boldly and fearlessly leave him to his fate you afforded him assistance to save a pitiful remnant of his property, and affected benevolence and kindness to a man you hated. I understand it all, Sir Arthur. It was not unnatural, but it was insincere. We have been upon good terms for many years, replied the baronet, who had now resumed his usual demeanour. Good terms? repeated Norris with a laugh. Well, be it so. "'You are now keeping up the appearance of good terms with the government, "'which you then opposed, and of which you spoke in language certainly seditious, "'as it is called, and perhaps treasonable. "'These things have created a doubt. "'That doubt must be removed, not by words and professions, "'not by appearances and pretenses, but by acts. "'Speak plainly,' said Sir Arthur Adelon. "'What is it that you want?' "'There is a meeting to be held at twelve o'clock this night "'in the little town of Barhampton,' said Norris, "'where several gentlemen entertaining precisely the same sentiments "'which you expressed some eight years ago to the people of Yorkshire "'are to take into consideration what decisive measures can be adopted "'for obtaining those objects which you then professed to seek. "'I require that you should then join us and be one of us.' "'Impossible!' cried Sir Arthur Adelon, with a look of consternation and astonishment. "'Would you have me attend a seditious meeting at midnight with a man who has fled from the course of justice? I, a magistrate for the county?' A bitter smile came upon the lip of his companion. But he replied immediately, "'Even so, I would indeed, Sir Arthur. The spirit of patriotism is not so strong in you, it would seem, as the spirit of revenge.' or you would not hesitate. But this much, to end all, one way or the other, you either come, and if you do come and frankly join us, without any insincerity, receive the papers I have mentioned, or you stay away, and Mr. Edward Dudley receives them. "'This is unfair!' exclaimed Sir Arthur Adelon. "'Unfair?' replied Norris. "'How unfair, sir!' i acting according to my conscience however you may be acting my only reason for withholding these letters from the person who would have the right to possess them if their suppression were not necessary to the service of my country is because i trust that you whose name and station may be an infinite advantage as a leader of the people hereafter will put yourself in that position in which no want of moral courage no vacillating hesitation can be shown or would be possible if you refuse to do so you will take from me my only motive for not giving them to him who will know how to use them rightly you will show yourself as insincere in your professions of patriotism as you were insincere in your professions of friendship and i shall then regard you with contempt and treat you without consideration there was a stern and commanding energy in his manner which crushed down as it were in the breast of Sir Arthur Adelon, the angry feelings which his impetuous words aroused. He felt cowed in the presence of the bold, fearless man who addressed him. He remembered, in former times, several traits of his decision and unhesitating vehemence, and he felt sure that he would do as much or more than he said. At first, indeed, anger was predominant. He gathered himself up, as it were, for a spring, but his heart failed him, and he said in a mild tone, "'You are too fierce. You are too fierce. Let me consider for a moment how this can be arranged. 
I am as willing as any one to make sacrifices for my country's advantage. But first you take me by surprise. Next you use words and proceed in a manner which are little likely to induce me to trust you to your guidance. He thought he had got an advantage, and he was proceeding, gradually resuming a tone of dignity, when Norris stopped him, saying, "'Sir Arthur Adelon, there are times and circumstances which of themselves, and in their own pressing nature, abridge all ceremonies. If your house were on fire, and you in danger of perishing by the flames, I should not wait for the punctilios of etiquette, but should wake you roughly, saying, "'Run, run, save your life and your family.' sir i tell you england is on fire and the time is come for all men to choose their part the days of weak indifference are over now is the time for decision and action but nevertheless i will not leave you any excuse but humbly entreat you to come to our meeting to-night and support with your presence and your voice and your influence those principles which you have asserted warmly on other occasions but it may be very difficult to manage said sir arthur adelon i have guests in my house whom i cannot in courtesy leave without some exceedingly good excuse i am not accustomed to go out at such hours of the night and to do so will certainly appear very suspicious especially under existing circumstances all that will be easily arranged answered norris you are a magistrate you say and may consequently be called upon at any hour on pressing occasions you do not of course communicate to your family or your guests the exact business which calls you forth or the motives for going at one hour rather than another but should anything more be wanting to smooth the way for you i will presently write you a note calling upon you to be at barhampton to-night at twelve on matters of importance i do not think he added with a sneering smile that even your confessor will venture to cross-question a gentleman of your independence upon a business with which he has nothing to do certainly not replied sir arthur adelon and i have no objection to come but i cannot bind myself to anything till i hear upon what measures your friends decide nor can i bind myself to anything then till i hear upon what you do decide rejoined norris the papers are yours whenever you act up to your professions i shall ask nothing more sir arthur i have a copy of your speech upon an occasion which you well remember i will require nothing more of you than to fulfil the pledges therein given and the moment you prove you are ready so to act i resign into your hands those letters of which others might not judge so favourably as i am inclined to judge do you promise to come i do answered sir arthur adelon in a firmer tone than he had hitherto used but with a certain degree of bitterness too yet norris there are various other thoughts and considerations of deep moment which our conversation of to-day suggests it revives in me the memories and feelings of past years you should have considered that these matters had passed away from my mind for a long time that of the plans and hopes and schemes and passions of those times some have been accomplished or gratified and have been well-nigh forgotten some from the utter hopelessness of seeing them accomplished have faded away and become more like a vision than a reality what will not a man do when he is eager and excited with the vehement impulse of fresh feelings and sharp discussions and the enthusiasm of those who surround him but take those accessories away and the purposes themselves fall into a sleep from which it requires some time and preparation to arouse them into active and energetic being again you should have considered this and not pressed me so eagerly without some preparation perhaps i should replied norris but sir arthur you have known me long and have known me to be a brief and abrupt man my purposes never sleep my objects never fade the one engrossing object of my country's fate and the welfare of my fellow-men is never a passing vision to my eyes but a stern reality ever present so that i am little able to comprehend the hesitations of other men sir arthur adelon while the other spoke had cast down his eyes thoughtfully as if little attending to the words of his companion but when he ceased speaking he said in an abstracted manner this dudley too he has intruded himself into my family he is now at brandon as you have doubtless heard the cold icy hand seemed to seize my heart again when i saw him 
I felt as if the spawn of the viper were before me, and as if it were destined that the race were to survive and poison my peace, even when the reptile that first stung me was crushed. Norris gazed at him steadfastly, with his brow contracted with a steady, contemplative, inquiring look, and then he replied, "'I do beseech you, Sir Arthur Adelon, to banish such thoughts, to let the faults of the dead, if faults there were, rest with the dead. I think you believe in a god, do you not? Well, sir, there is a god who will judge him and you. He is gone to receive his judgment. The time will come ere long for you to receive yours. In the meanwhile, injure not one who has never injured you, and pursue this fell and heinous vengeance no further against the son of one whom you once loved. And of one I always hated, answered the baronet, finishing the sentence for him. But do you not know, Norris, that as the sweetest wine turns soonest to vinegar, so love, wronged and despised, changes to the bitterest hate? As for the rest, I purpose pursuing no vengeance against the young man. I wish he would quit my dwelling, for the very feeling of being obliged to maintain a courteous and soft demeanour towards him, increases the loathing with which I regard him. That is all. That is all, I assure you. I would do him no harm, but I love him not, nevertheless. I can see that, Sir Arthur Adelon, answered his companion, and I see, moreover, a dark and sinister fire in your eyes, which I observed once before, when first in my presence you mentioned the name of Mr. Dudley to my partner. There were deeds followed that mention, which I need not call to your mind. I trust there will be none such now, nay, nor any attempt towards them, if there be, I will prevent it. I am not so good a lawyer, indeed I know but little of the trade, I am not so good a lawyer as Mr. Sherborne, but I am a bolder, more resolute, and more honest man. However, I shall see you to-night, is it not so? Undoubtedly, answered Sir Arthur Adelon, but you have not yet told me where I shall find you in Barhampton. You had better go to the little inn, the rose i think it is called replied norris there is but one there some one shall come to lead you to us for we are upon our guard sir arthur and resolute neither to be taken unawares as some men have been nor to act rashly and bring down destruction on our own heads as those thoughtless weak and poor-spirited men did in yorkshire i am very happy to hear it said the baronet in a tone of sincerity i will be there somewhat before twelve till then farewell and shaking norris by the hand with every sort of apparent cordiality he left him and returned to brandon but when he had re-entered the house he retired for some time to the library not to consider his future conduct not to review the past it was in truth that the conversation of that morning had aroused within him feelings dark bitter and deadly which had slept for years and he felt he could not see Mr. Dudley without calming himself, lest sensations should appear which he wished studiously to conceal from every eye. End of chapter 8 Chapter Nine of the Convict by G. P. R. James. The Slipperbox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. With a quiet, cat-like watchfulness, Mister Filmer remarked everything which passed between Eda Brandon and Charles Dudley. It was not words that he laid in wait for, but looks and gestures, the involuntary as well as the voluntary, the trifling as well as the important nothing escaped him not even the accidental trait or the slightest possible indication of a passing emotion not the quick glance of the eye withdrawn as soon as given not the trembling hand nor the quivering lip not the irrepressible sigh not the fit of absence and the sudden raising of the look to the loved one's face was unremarked by one who knew human nature well and had made a trade of observation they love was his conclusion and they understand each other that walk home has concluded what seems to have been begun long ago 
now then what good is to be derived from this affair it is a common calculation which he made but one very apt to mislead men who see others labouring for the gratification of their passions are often tempted by the opportunity to endeavour to rule them for their own purposes and then whatever event occurs they ask what good is to be derived from this affair but they often miscalculate because they do not ask themselves also is there anything to be made of it with honour and honesty if they did they might succeed where they every day fail mr filmer however had his own particular views which led him upon one peculiar course his very position gave a direction to all his actions the roman priest stands alone amidst the world separated from all the dearest ties of our nature by an irremovable barrier he may have sympathies but they are curtailed and restricted he may have affections but they are limited and enthralled one predominant object is ever before him one career is fixed for his efforts he stands alone in the world i repeat not so much the servant of god as the servant of a hierarchy to the interest and advancement of which all his energies must be devoted and for whose purposes all his talents must be employed as long as he can bring the satisfaction of affections and the gratification of any passions within the circle to which the whole course of education from his earliest years has restricted his consciousness of duty perhaps they may be more strongly i had almost said more fiercely exercised from the very fact of their narrow range but the moment they would go beyond that limit the petrifying influence of an engrossing church comes in and changes the man into the mere representation of a system such was the situation of mr filmer he was by no means without passions fiery eager impetuous but they were subdued to the one strict rule and setting out with that mighty conquest it was in general more easy for him to subdue the minds of other men also he was not without considerable abilities abilities approaching genius he might have been a great man in short if he had not been compelled to be an artful man but for a priest of that church in the midst of an adverse population it is impossible to be otherwise it is not a religion of openness and candour and its means must be covert its course tortuous and indirect even in the very case of mr dudley his passions were not quiescent but he was prepared to sacrifice all personal feeling for the one great object of his existence and he watched as i have said asking himself to what uses the events taking place could be applied it was not however dudley alone whom he watched nor dudley and eda sir arthur adelon was also an object of attentive consideration during the evening there was something in his manner which showed the keen eye of the priest that the mind was not at ease that there was something working within the baronet's bosom and he was surprised that it was not revealed to him at once for the secret of sir arthur adelon's thoughts was not often concealed from him the whole of his past life had been displayed before filmer's eyes and much which had been taking place had been discussed again and again between them so far there was nothing to be concealed and the priest marvelled that if anything had gone wrong in the course of sir arthur's morning expedition he could sit for several hours without communicating the fact to him sir arthur however paused and hesitated not that he feared at all to recur to the past but it was his yet unconfirmed purposes for the future which he hesitated to reveal he knew that filmer was a firmer more resolute man than himself he doubted that he would approve any even the slightest concession to fear that he was politic and skilful he knew and that his policy and skill would be exercised in his patron's behalf he was also fully convinced but there was a dread upon him 
and he apprehended that the priest would advise measures too bold for his nerves at that time if he had been forced into vigorous defence sir arthur would have sought his advice at once but there was a choice of courses before him he hesitated hesitation is always a weakness and as such is sure to take the weaker course twice however during the evening he caught filmer's eye resting upon him with a very inquiring look he judged that he suspected something and therefore he resolved in the end to tell him a part to show him a half confidence deceiving himself as all men in such circumstances do deceive themselves and believing that he could to a certain extent deceive mr filmer also although he had known that clear-sighted and penetrating man for seven and twenty years the dinner passed most cheerfully with all but sir arthur adelon lord hadley was in great spirits and sitting next to eda he made himself as agreeable as moderate talents gentlemanly manners and no very decided character would admit dudley was calm by no means so gay as his young companion but yet the happiness that was in his heart like a lamp within an alabaster urn spread light and cheerfulness over all mr filmer was as usual composed and tranquil in his manner at times impressive in his language but often adding to the gaiety of others by a quiet jest or epigrammatic reply which derived additional force from his seeming unconscious of its possessing any eda left the table very soon after the dessert had appeared there were those things in her bosom which made her feel happy in the solitude of her own chamber thought calm uninterrupted thought was at that moment very sweet to her she loved and was beloved and she had the grand satisfaction of feeling that she had it in her power to raise one to whom her affections had been given for years who possessed her highest esteem and who she knew well deserved high station from unmerited misfortunes to the position which he was born to ornament it was indeed a blessing and eda went and pondered upon it till her eyes filled with pleasant tears for about a quarter of an hour after she had gone sir arthur adelon continued at the table passing the wine with somewhat nervous haste and keeping up a broken conversation from which his thoughts were often absent at length he said speaking across the table filmer my reverend friend i wish to speak with you for a few minutes lord hadley mr dudley you must not suffer the wine to stand while we are absent i shall be back almost immediately and he led the way out of the room filmer followed him with a quiet smile saying to himself as he walked along towards the library what men do timidly they always do awkwardly in that they are different from women in whom timidity is grace adelon has had twenty opportunities of speaking to me and has of course chosen the worst well filmer said the baronet almost before the door was closed i have something to talk to you about of great importance i thought so sir arthur answered mr filmer what is it why do you think so inquired his friend somewhat surprised and somewhat apprehensive because it seemed to me that you had been annoyed at something replied filmer when you are uneasy sir arthur it is soon perceived too soon indeed the young and unobserving may not remark such things but one who has been i trust i may say your friend for so many years can perceive when you are uneasy in a moment and a very shrewd judge of men's feelings and actions which i do not pretend to be would i doubt not discover the uneasiness even without having the advantage of such long acquaintance these words as he intended added to the embarrassment which sir arthur already felt but nevertheless he pursued his course endeavouring as far as possible to conceal that he had any concealment well filmer well he said men cannot always alter their natures you know and the matter is one which might well cause uneasiness you recollect that affair of charles dudley you do not at all doubt that this is his son who is here no answered mr filmer dryly but we knew that last night i certainly did from the moment i saw the back of his head 
and your face left no doubt that you had made the same discovery. "'The very first sight of him,' answered Sir Arthur Adelon bitterly, "'and the feelings which that sight produced left me no doubt of who it was that stood before me. "'But listen a moment, Filmer, listen a moment. "'There is much more behind. "'You remember well that business of Charles Dudley, I say, of him who was my friend and companion, "'my rival and my enemy.' and last my acquaintance and your victim murmured filmer in so low a tone that sir arthur adelon did not remark the words but added and my debtor you doubtless also remember the election which we contested and my lawyers messrs sherborne and norris perfectly answered filmer the one the soul of policy and intrigue shrewd penetrating subtle and faithless the other the incarnation of republican energy and determination, rash and inconsiderate, though full of vigour and ability. He was implicated a short time ago in the Chartist insurrection, apprehended with his fellows, if I remember right, and thrust into York jail. Whence he made his escape in two or three days, rejoined Sir Arthur Adelon. It would be a strong prison that would keep him in. However, Sherborne is dead, Norris alive, well and in this country that is no great matter then answered mr filmer sherborne was a dangerous man and he is gone all your communications were with him my good friend at least as far as i know and i think i saw every letter the words i think were spoken in a somewhat doubtful tone as if he did not feel quite sure of the extent of sir arthur's confidence but the baronet replied eagerly every one filmer and indeed as you well know many of them were dictated by yourself true said the priest true i am happy to say they were i say i am happy sir arthur because it was but right that that man should receive a cheque not contented with marrying a lady of the only true church who was promised by her relations to one of their own just and reasonable belief he perverted her from the path of truth into that of error and in twelve months had filled her mind with all the foulest doctrines of that heresy in which he had himself been brought up it was just and right sir arthur that he should not be permitted to go on in such a course and that he should feel even here the consequences of those acts yes but my dear friend replied sir arthur adelon those papers are of much importance let me tell you both your character and mine are compromised if they should ever see the light but you told me they were burned said mr filmer with a countenance less firm and tranquil than usual yes so sherborne assured me most solemnly replied sir arthur adelon but nevertheless it is not the truth they are all in the hands of this norris and he is using every possible means to render them available for his own purposes this was, as the reader knows, substantially true, for Sir Arthur Adelon was one of those men who do not like to tell a direct falsehood, even when it is their intention to deceive, and he intended his words to convey to the mind of the priest a very different impression of Norris's intentions, while he could always fall back upon the precise terms he had employed, and put a larger interpretation upon them than Mr. Filmer was likely to do at the moment the priest mused why what can he do with them he demanded at length still in a thoughtful tone they can be of little service to him the time is long past the circumstance is altogether forgotten charles dudley of st austin's is dead but his son is living replied the baronet quickly impatient that his companion did not see the importance of the documents at once his son is living norris knows that he is here and he threatens to place the whole of the papers in his hands that might be unpleasant certainly answered filmer although you had every right to act as you did act at least such i humbly judge to be the case yet one would not like to have all one's private and confidential communications to a solicitor exposed to the eyes of an adversary's son like exclaimed sir arthur vehemently filmer you use wonderfully cold terms to-night why it would be ruin and destruction 
call to mind i beg of you all the particulars of the transaction remember what was done to lead him on from expense to expense in that business remember all which that man sherborne suggested and which we executed the matter of the petition too against his return and what was arranged between our people and his own agents and the business of the floor in the title you must have forgotten i think oh no replied the priest i have not forgotten sir arthur and i say it would be unpleasant very unpleasant what does this person norris ask for the papers oh a great deal answered sir arthur adelon still speaking with that sort of mental reservation which he had learned betimes more than i am inclined to grant a great deal more but i shall see him to-night i have an appointment with him at barhampton and shall there learn what is the real extent of his demand the priest meditated for several minutes with a grave and somewhat anxious countenance norris he said at length was a wild and somewhat eccentric man but as far as i could judge a just and honest one his views too though somewhat extreme as his acts were occasionally ill-timed were all in the right direction i am afraid sir arthur we have fallen back from the ground we then occupied the truth is my excellent friend the church of rome as it is called the catholic church as it really is has not that tendency which men suppose towards the aristocratic distinctions which have risen up in this land it might place upon its banner the words civil liberty spiritual submission it reverences all ancient things amongst the rest ancient blood but is certainly opposed to an aristocracy springing from the people and founded upon wealth although in itself it may be termed a spiritual republic in which every man according to his genius and ability can with the grace of god rise to the very highest of its grades even to the chair of st peter itself we have often seen it but as this is the case in all republics the utmost submission is required to the ruling power although there is always a corrective for the misuse of power in the synods and councils it is a hierarchy indeed but a hierarchy open to all men and as a hierarchy it is opposed to the domination of all lay powers which are ever inclined to resist the milder influence of spiritual powers but what has all this to do with the question exclaimed sir arthur adelon not comprehending what the reader has perhaps perceived that the priest was carrying on in words one train of reasoning very loosely connected with the immediate subject while in thought he was revolving more pertinently all the difficult points that were before him what i mean to say is this replied mr filmer men consider it strange that roman catholics should from time to time give their support to movements savouring of republicanism and that persons whose views tend to republicanism should often link themselves closely with catholics but as i have shown the connection is not at all unnatural and the views of this good man norris might well be as they were supported by ourselves even were it not perfectly right and justifiable in the pursuit of a great and all-important object to combine even with men the most opposed to us in the minor points of politics when by doing so we see the probability of advancing the truth what would you have me then join with him now exclaimed sir arthur in considerable surprise for the arguments of father peter went so directly to support the inducements held out by norris that the baronet could hardly persuade himself that there had not been some communication between the chartist and the priest i did not exactly say that answered filmer men's views frequently undergo a change in a few years i know not what this man's opinion may now be he was then an eager advocate for perfect freedom of religious opinions he was then for sweeping away altogether what they call here the church of the state and leaving every man to follow what creed he thinks best but surely my reverend friend exclaimed sir arthur adelon such are principles you would never support or even tolerate it was in his religious views alone that i differed from norris 
the priest smiled with one of those calm sagacious smiles that have a certain though moderate portion of triumph in them the triumph of superior astuteness i would support them for their hour he said i remember hearing of a wise stratagem practised by a great general who was besieging a refractory city the inhabitants had dammed up a river which ran on one side of the town and thus had defended their walls on that side from all attack the dam or barrier which they had constructed was immediately under the fire of one of their strongest works so that it was unassailable but the general of whom i speak by a week's hard labour turned the course of a still larger river into that which served for their defence and the mighty torrent rushing down swept away the barriers altogether the river resumed its equal flow and the attacking army marching on took the town by storm on the very side where it had been judged impregnable the barrier which keeps the waters up is the heretical church of this country and we have naught to do but to pour the torrent of licentious freedom against that barrier till it is quite overthrown in order to have a clear way for our march and to secure our ultimate triumph the baronet paused and mused for several moments partly considering the new views which his companion had propounded partly debating with himself as to whether he should make his confidence more complete than he had at first intended and before he replied mr filmer went on again i do not mean to say sir arthur he continued that i would advise you to take any rash or dangerous step and indeed on the contrary i think you had a great deal better while you give encouragement to the moral movement oppose most strongly all appeal to force till the country is far more prepared for it than at present to show yourself upon their side may give vigour to their proceedings may gain many adherents to range themselves openly with them who are merely restrained by fear and timidity and may assist them in raising that prestige of power numbers and respectability which if it can be maintained conquers in the end all opposition for as you are well aware so curiously constituted is the mind of this nation that no question however absurd no view however false no measure however evil and detrimental will not gain the adherence of the great multitude if they can once be taught to believe by truth or falsehood that it is supported by numbers and by respectability i have no doubt that if i could show or rather if i could persuade the people of england that there are a million or two of atheists in the land demanding the abolition of all religious worship whatsoever the great body of the people will be easily induced to renounce their god and endeavour to sweep away every trace of religion from the land there is no being on the face of the earth so susceptible of moral contagion as an englishman it is a dark view of the case said sir arthur adelon but a true one answered filmer otherwise england would have been still catholic however to return to these papers you say you will see norris again to-night you must then discover what is the extent of his demand i would make him no promises were i in your place till i had had time for thought and deliberation neither would i refuse anything that he might demand that is to say not absolutely till we have consulted together i will go with you if you like to speak with him i do not think he would open his views before another said sir arthur hastily but it is as well my reverend friend to be prepared against the worst let us consider what must be done should this man's views be very exorbitant and should he refuse all time for deliberation then you must say no of course replied filmer and we will take measures against his measures i can see none that we can take answered the baronet gloomily he would instantly place the papers in this young man's hands and then ruin and destruction and disgrace would be the consequence should you find that there is danger of his doing so suddenly was mr filmer's reply we must deal with mr dudley ourselves either in attaching him to us by bringing him over to the true faith again or there is no chance of that 
there is no chance of that exclaimed the baronet interrupting him and waving his hand impatiently filmer you think your eloquence can do everything but you could as soon move the church of st peter and set it down in the capital of england as you would bring back to the true faith one of that stubborn race of heretics you are prejudiced my friend replied filmer calmly but do not suppose that i rely upon my own eloquence i can do nothing but by strength from on high and the voice of the true church is powerful still temporal means must be employed as well and i see a way before me of so completely rendering it his interest notwithstanding every cause of enmity he may have to bury all past deeds in oblivion to seek your friendship rather than your hate and i trust even to return to the bosom of the church that i am not without very great hopes of success should these hopes prove vain however my dear sir arthur should he show himself deaf to the voice of truth obstinate in error revengeful and rancorous in disposition we must use the right of self-defence which every creature has and in a firm determined spirit but with prudent skill retort upon him any attack he may make upon you and without hesitation or fear aim blow after blow till he either sinks beneath the assault or is driven to flight for safety his brow gathered into a stern and determined frown as he spoke and sir arthur adelon so well knew his unflinching resolution in the hour of danger and his keen and subtle policy in the time of difficulty that he gained courage from the courage of his companion and smiled with some bitter satisfaction at the thought of pursuing the vengeance he had already heaped upon the father to the destruction of the son likewise he only ventured to observe how either of these two objects is to be accomplished i do not see leave that to me answered filmer in a confident tone i think you have never known me fail sir arthur in that which i promised you to perform i will mature my plans prepare my ground for either course and though there may be difficulties which would startle a weak irresolute or unpractised mind they alarm not me on the contrary i often think it is a blessing of god that i am placed in a calm and tranquil position of life and have embraced a sacred profession which rules and regulates the turbulent impulses of our nature for i feel a sort of expansion of mind and rejoicing of heart when circumstances compel me to struggle with intricate and perilous difficulties and overcome stubborn and apparently insurmountable obstacles which might have led me had i not been excluded from mundane things into the strife and toil and degrading greatness of mere earthly ambition it is probable that he really believed what he said for there is no man who does not deceive himself more or less and those who from passion or interest or education or any other evil inducement fall into the darkest errors are those who are in most need of self-deception he thought deeply for a moment or two after he had spoken and there was a gloomy look of pride upon his countenance too as if he even regretted that in which he pretended to rejoice a shadow from the fallen archangel's wing but then again he roused himself with a start and said in an ordinary and composed tone we will talk over our old plans early to-morrow sir arthur you had better now go to your conference not yet said sir arthur rising it is not to take place till twelve but we must rejoin those young men or they may think our prolonged absence strange thus saying he led the way to the door and filmer only detained him to add one sentence remember he said do not commit yourself End of chapter nine